Good morning, Pastor Rob here. Had a break from yesterday. Uh, had a birthday celebration here at the house, so I was a little busy. But today we're going to be in Mark chapter 1. Take a little bit of time. We'll go through verses 1 through 8. And maybe just go through the whole book if you're going to study along. And thank you, YouTube, for the opportunity to do this. Thank you for all the... We have uh, almost 400 followers now. And what's really cool is some of my family's on. It's like we can have a Bible study together. So... Before we get started, let's just go into uh, Mark chapter 1 and um, look at things. So four things I want to look at. Number one is Mark establishes the credibility. The author is thought to be John Mark, who was uh, a follower of Peter, a person that was um, with Peter, heard his teachings, and then recorded them in this book. He was also the cousin thought to be a Barnabas, um, who uh, Paul and Barnabas were on missionary journeys together in John Mark is the one who Paul was upset about. They were on a missionary journey and Mark left. So Paul and Barnabas got into an argument over that. And Barnabas left and is never heard from again, by the way. And Paul begins his missionary journeys with Silas. And then the rest of that's recorded in the book of Acts. So it's thought to be the author is John Mark. And I. so what he's doing is establishing his credibility, number one. Number two, he quotes the prophecy regarding the subject matter of his book, which is Jesus Christ. And then number three, the fulfillment of that prophecy. And number four, just a side note that I like, was um, the elements of salvation are found in, in verse four. So pretty neat for the first four things to look at. So let's read Mark chapter one, if you have your Bible. Just open up the beginning of the gospel. One of the neat things here is if you look at Genesis chapter one and John chapter one, all both of them say, in the beginning. So, you know, this is a neat, I don't know if it's a play on words or just a, a thing that they used uh, while writing these books. The beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah, Harry points out the prophecy. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, this is referring to John the Baptist. Uh, who is also the Elijah who was to come. And Jesus Christ actually alludes to that in Matthew 11. So we'll look at that in a minute. So that's the, the authenticity of this book is that it's based on the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, and he's pointing out that this prophecy in Isaiah 40 verse 3 is about John the Baptist. John the Baptist fulfills that. And then it goes into verse 4. It says, And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching baptism repentance for the forgiveness of sins the whole judean countryside and all the people of jerusalem came and went out to him confessing their sins and they were baptized by him in the jordan river so if you saw one of my lessons on salvation then you see right here the elements of salvation believing on jesus christ responding to the gospel repenting of your sins so Repenting is turning another direction away from your desires and your sins to Jesus Christ and the cross and confessing your sins. It's all right here in, uh, John, in Mark chapter uh, 1, verse 4 and 5. So, and then they got baptized. So they confessed, repented, and, uh, and then responded to the gospel. And then they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Verse 6, now John wore clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Not sure that even in the military, even as a ranger, I would want to eat locusts and honey. However, if you're hungry enough, you might eat anything, but that doesn't sound like a very good diet to me. But he ate locusts and honey, and this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I. This is speaking of Jesus Christ. Uh, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So you have the past, the prophecies of the past, the fulfillment in the present, and then you have the future fulfillment, which is when Jesus Christ will uh, release the Holy Spirit uh, in Acts chapter 2. I really think that's amazing. But he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then at that time, so we'll stop there on uh, verse 8 and just take a look at this. So the fulfillments of prophecy, Isaiah 40 Verse, you know, Isaiah was written around the 700s uh, BC, before Christ even came. And so this is speaking of the Messiah, the Messianic prophecies. The Jews would have known that. The message being preached to this congregation at this time, and the time this book was written, 
would be very substantial to them. It would be something common knowledge. They were looking for a Messiah, and that Messiah wouldn't come until the messenger had come first. And that messenger and that prophecy was fulfilled by John the Baptist. What did he do? He paved the way for Jesus Christ. So he's the fulfillment. But even more specific is there's a prophecy, uh, and actually there's a prophet that would come in Deuteronomy 18, 15. They were expecting a prophet to come. Uh, and so John the Baptist comes as the prophet, as the Elijah who was to come before Jesus Christ, the Messiah, would come. So he paves the way. So if you look at Isaiah 40, verse 3, it says, It's written in Isaiah the prophet, My messenger will go ahead of you and will prepare your way. This is what John the Baptist is doing. This is what Mark is doing to establish the authenticity of of this gospel. It's fulfilling prophecy, everyone. This is why I'm writing this. This is a big moment for over, uh, geez, seven, 800 years now. We've been waiting for this to happen, and now it's finally happened, just like we're waiting for the second coming. It's been 2,000 years prophesied that Jesus would return. We're waiting for that, and when it happens, we're going to know that's the fulfillment. We're going to, the whole world's going to know. Just like this. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus would come. But first, there had to be a forerunner, and that forerunner was John the Baptist. Um, more specifically, in Malachi 3, verse 1, if you have your Bible, you want to write that down. Malachi 3, verse 1. Let me see if I marked that. That would be helpful. Malachi 3. So there's a couple prophecies here in Malachi. I will send my messenger who will prepare your way before me. So, uh, John the Baptist fulfills that messenger role. There's also another one in uh, Malachi 4, 5, which refers to the Elijah, by the way. And that's why this is so important. So Malachi 3, 1 talks about the messenger that's going to come. And then Malachi 4, 5 says, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord when he comes. And he, and this is specifically about John the Baptist, this is what he did. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. So three prophecies fulfilled in John the Baptist. Now, when the Pharisees asked John in John chapter one, are you the Messiah? Are you the Elijah that was to come? He says, no, I'm just a voice of one calling in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. He was called by God. He knew what his role was. He did not confess that he was the Messiah or confess that he was the Elijah that was to come. So just taking a quick look at that, Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 11, this is when John is in prison, by the way, and his disciples were asking Jesus, are you the Messiah or should we look for another? What's unique about that is you would think that with John the Baptist, who is Jesus's cousin, by the way, is in prison. He's been preaching on behalf of Jesus Christ. He's been paving the way. He's in prison and he's beginning to doubt. So as a believer today, if you ever have any doubt, don't beat yourself up. It happens. We have doubt. We have doubt in times of trouble. We don't know why evil happens. And John the Baptist himself, who paved the way for Jesus, doubted, are you really the Messiah or should we look for something, somebody else? What's neat is that when they approach Jesus, he quotes to them Isaiah 35. And he says, go tell John this, the blind see, the lame walk, the good news is preached. I think it's Isaiah 35, 5, or right around there. But prior to that verse is another verse in Isaiah 35 that says, Behold, your Messiah is coming to rescue you. He doesn't use that verse. He admits that verse from that, that, that quote. So just so you know, while John's in prison, he sends, his, um, he sends his disciples to go to Jesus and say, Are you the Messiah? Should we wait for somebody else? And he sends them back then. He says, I'm not coming to get you, John. Just know that your preaching was valuable. It, it served its purpose. I am the Messiah that was to come. And so, uh, but this is what he says. So even though John has denied being the Elijah, in Matthew 11, it says this. Um, Matthew 11, 11, we'll start. Well, we won't start. It takes too long. But look at uh, Matthew eleven thirteen. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. John was the fulfillment of some prophecy. And if you are willing to accept it, referring to John the Baptist, he is the Elijah who was to come. Now, if you have ears to hear, you need to hear this. He's the forerunner of me. He's making this pathway straight. He's paving the way 
for the gospel. He's paving the way for the Messiah. As a matter of fact, and this is why this verse in, um, in Mark chapter 1 is so significant when you look at uh, that he wore a leather belt and camel's hair. That's significant because that points to Elijah as well. And Mark recorded that. But it, Jesus says in Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah that was to come. Now, John denied that, but Jesus confirms that he was the Elijah that was to come as prophesied. And verse 6 of Mark chapter 1 says, John wore a uh, clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and honey. If you turn to 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, what is Elijah wearing in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8? It says right here, uh, what kind of man is this who came to meet you? He's talking to the people he sent to go uh, talk to the prophet. And it says they replied in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, He was a man with a garment of hair and with a leather belt around his waist. And the king says that was Elijah. So that's why this is significant in Mark chapter 1, that Mark points out that John the Baptist wore a clothing made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he laid, he ate locusts and wild honey, pointing out and referring to the Elijah that was to come before Jesus Christ. So John the Baptist fulfilled all these things. And, and so Isaiah was written referring to John the Baptist 700 years before Christ. Malachi, with those verses that we quoted, uh, Malachi 3, 1 and Malachi 4, 5, were written 400 years before Christ. So this is the fulfillment of these things. And then Jesus confirms that John was the Elijah as prophesied that was to come before he came. So John the Baptist fulfilled these roles, even though he personally denied it. Now, I think really it wasn't that he didn't think he was the Elijah. He just did not want to elevate himself above Christ the Messiah. He was humble. And he said, you know, in John 3, 30, he must increase, I must decrease. I'm not even worried to tie his shoes. The Messiah that, excuse me, I'm the forerunner for. So um, John was very humble in that. So the, we established the credibility of this by saying, you know, Mark was there. He, he, him and Peter, they witnessed all these things. The prop, Then the prophecies about Jesus Christ in Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3 and 4, they're all fulfilled uh, in the fact that Elijah was to come. That's John the Baptist. That was fulfilled. So all these things establish the credibility of this gospel before we even get started. But the one thing that I really like for our thing is if you're going to believe in Jesus Christ, if you're going to be saved, is the elements of salvation recorded right here in John, or excuse me, Mark chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. He came baptizing. He came preaching. The people responded to the message which you have done, which the Holy Spirit has led you to do. The Holy Spirit wants all men to come to the saving uh, knowledge of Jesus Christ. And in John 12, if I am lifted up, I will call all men unto me. There's nobody exempt from the opportunity to go to Jesus Christ and be saved. Regardless of where you come from, what country, what you speak, what your dialect, what your background, it doesn't matter. God wants all men to be saved. Uh, and then in uh, in 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All the way back to the Old Testament, where, where it says God has no glory in the, that anybody would go to hell, but that you would turn, turn from your wicked ways and live. That's the heart of God. He wants to heal you. He wants to save you. And these elements of salvation on how to do that are in the very first chapter of Mark. So he came baptized and he came preaching and the people respond to the message. What was he preaching? A baptism of repentance. What is that? Baptism of saying, turn from your wicked ways, turn away from the world, turn away from idolatry, turn away from anything that you have that doesn't agree with God and go after God. That's repentance. He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, by the way, in Hebrews, it says without the shedding of blood, which is what Jesus did on the cross, there's no remission of sin. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him and confessing their sins. If he confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And they were baptized by him. So they repented. They confessed their sins. They responded to the gospel and they were baptized into Jesus Christ in the Jordan River. So if you want the elements of salvation, there they are. The process of salvation is Mark chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. So I hope everybody has a great day. That's our first lesson in Mark chapter 1, and we'll continue.